Hello, welcome back to another um, session of Sociology of Sport. My name's Amina Mustafa, and today I'm going to be looking at how sport is inherently political. So that's what we're going to be doing today in the Global Goals World Cup Clubhouse. The um, global goals that I'll be looking at today is goal four, quality um, education, um, goal number 11, so reduce inequality, and goal number 16, which is related to peace, peace justice, and uh, institutions. So again, I'll be looking at um, how sport is inherently uh, political. I gave some examples before in previous um, clubhouse sessions where I was talking about sociology of sport. So if you haven't checked that out, I would recommend going back and having a look at some of those. I was introducing topics um, related to sport and society. So how the global goals can be uh, applied to society in general um, and how we can use sport to address those. But today, as I said, we'll be focusing on politics. And a lot of the time, I'm sure you've heard of the saying, like, uh, leave politics away from the dinner table. But we often talk about sport at the dinner table and sport is inherently political. Um, and I'm going to be delving into how that is today. So I'll first be, well, I'll be like looking at three main um, questions. So why do governments fund sports, but focusing particularly on elite sport? I'll be looking at something called ping pong diplomacy, um, which was a big uh, event that happened in sport um, between US and China through uh, ping pong. And I'll be explaining that. And then I'll also be giving another example related to the Olympics. So the Rio 2016 Olympics and political agendas and how that affects people that live in um, Brazil. But in the past, in previous sessions, I touched on some um, political tools that sport has, in particular um, when I was talking about Nelson Mandela and how he used rugby uh, to unite the country of South Africa. Um, but also in terms of policy and regulations when I was talking about testosterone um, and regulation of the female category. But today I'll be focusing on um, policy, by governments rather than um, sporting institutions. So the first thing I want to um, encourage you to do is think about what governments um, or what your government is doing to promote sport in your country. So if you haven't already, look at the, the policy in your country. Is there a department of sport? Um, a lot of countries have department of youth and sport. In Ireland, we don't. Sport is under um, the department of transport and tourism transport sport and tourism um whereas in england and in other countries there's a department specifically for sport um and then once you've found that look at what type of sport they encourage or they're promoting so are they promoting um participatory sport encouraging people um local communities to participate in sport or are they um primarily focusing on elite sport or spectator sport or is there a particular sport that they're encouraging um, people in the community to participate in. So what I was doing in my classes when I was teaching in uh, Nottingham was encouraging the students to look at policies that were put out or man mandates, sorry, put out by political parties um, and seeing what they were saying about sport. So some parties don't even talk about sport. Other parties focus on um, spectatorship and encouraging people to watch um, football in stadiums so it brings in money for a particular country or a region or whether they're encouraging physical activity in um, a local area so they're just some things to think about in terms of your own country and maybe comparing your country to other countries but today I'll be focusing on the sport policy in the UK so the UK um, model of sport and what is important about that and what I'm going to highlight is that the policy discourse or the discussion around sport policy in the UK changed in the mid nine in the mid nineties, um, 1990s. And there, there was a reason for that, um, or it correlates pretty well with something that happened or, um, around, well, just before that time, uh, which was, or after that time, yeah, just before, after that time, um, which was that 
England and the UK were to host the London 2012 Olympic Games. So that announcement happened prior to the Games, obviously, and that led to a shift in focus of what the UK government are promoting. So before they used to promote sport for all, and then um, they shifted in terms of the policy that was written about sport towards a more um, towards a focus on elite sport. So before it was sport for all, and then the focus was primarily on elite sport. Um, and a lot of the time, when we're looking at policy related to sport, it goes unquestioned, which is pretty unusual. So if you think about it, in whatever country you're in, people often question government funding or government spending. So if um, the government spend a lot of money on roads uh, or education, the way that they spend it will be questioned. So why did you uh, build this new highway when the local community don't have facilities in this particular area or um, it would have been better spent here, would have been better spent there. So why aren't people questioning the spending of governments in terms of sport? Well, that's linked to an idea that I introduced before in a previous session. So as well, if you want to learn more about that, I would recommend going back and watching another episode that, um, or another session of Sociology of Sport. But uh, the reason why people don't look for an explanation or a justification for government spending in terms of sport is because of the term, the great sports myth. So that's the idea that sport is inherently good and anybody that participates in sport benefits um so in it, it in itself is inherently good um so in relation to government spending if governments spend money on sport that's a good thing um so what's the point in questioning it so what i'm going to look at today is a paper that was written by um Griggs and Carmichael in 2012 and they looked at the model of sport in the uk but this model can be applied to a lot of countries and you see it um a similar model in you or not in obviously it's in the UK, but in the US and uh, America, or US and Canada, that's what I meant to say. You see a similar model, similar to the UK model in those countries. Um, so this particular model is based on certain assumptions of sport. Uh, so one of them being that sport is good. But what we're gonna look at is what are they promoting why are they promoting it? And again, the question that I asked you before, what type of sport are they promoting? So is that spectator sport? Is that participatory sport? Um, what type of sport are they promoting? Who um, are they promoting it to? And who are they um, limiting uh, from participating? And what type of sport? So what type of um, form does it come in? Um, so what I want to go into is that model, which is called the virtuous cycle of sport. So the reason, um, why governments fund sport uh, can be explained by this picture. So I'm not the best drawer, but I um, try to make it a bit visual so you can understand. So the assumption um, that policy often use to promote elite sport is that elite sport success leads to, um, so it goes this way, an increase in mass participation among citizens um, and a general feeling, feeling of uh, good feeling, let's say, yeah, feeling of good feeling, let's just say. Um, so increased participation among the masses, um, which then in turn leads to uh, a healthier nation. So this is a heartbeat um, and heart for health. And then a little ribbon. So what it does is increases the health of the nation, but also increases or gives a wider pool of people to pick from that will be future champions in sport. Um, so again, elite sport uh, success leads to national prestige, which encourages um, mass participation in that particular sport or in sport in general, um, which then leads to a healthier nation and a wider pool of talent to pick from, which then goes back to elite sport. So leading to more success for your nation. Um, and that's the cycle that, uh, is called the virtuous cycle of sport, which was um, designed or uh, theorized by Griggs and Carmichael in 2012. Um, and that's based off a lot of assumptions. So I'll just present some uh, ideas. Elite sport. So if a, a nation does really well in a particular sport, 
um, the assumption is that it will lead to increased participation. But uh, nowadays, a lot of um, engagement with sport is in terms of spectatorship. So if your nation does really well, so say you're a Manchester United fan or you're a Liverpool fan, just because you're a fan doesn't mean um, it makes you want to play. It might, if your team are doing well, it might make you be a stronger supporter, but um, might encourage you to actually participate in the sport. Um, so there's particular sports that ha are doing really well in a certain country and they might be a minority sport. So that means that very few people actually play it, but they're still doing really well. Um, so some countries that might be table tennis, they're doing really well, but a lot of people in that country um, uh, aren't participating. Even let's say fencing. A country might do really well in fencing, but that doesn't mean that a lot of people are participating in that sport. So that's just one example. Um, and that's one assumption that policy has in terms of elite success leading to increased participation. So another assumption um, is that increased participation in a particular sport increases the health of the nation. Um, so uh, a lot of the time research shows if you participate in physical activity, it leads to um, a healthier um, health or well, like bodily health overall. Um, but that's not always the case. So let's take elite sport, for example, Athletes that are pushing themselves to compete at an elite level often um, are willing to uh, push the limits and uh, risk injury. So that that's just one example. I'm not saying that's the, what's going to happen all the time or that's what you see often. So the, in general, uh, increased uh, physical activity leads to better health. But there are the cases that um, lead to injury um competition so negative uh association so let's say um uh, tension between players um damage and health and then another assumption is that it leads to a wider pool of talent to pick from for um the next round of champions that will rule that particular sport but oftentimes people that participate in sport don't um, participate in it in the hopes that they are going to be competing at an elite level so there's so many um, examples of that in terms of uh, teams that are set up just for fun. So I myself participate in football, but it doesn't mean that I want to be Ireland's um, next uh, top player. Or you might play um, table tennis for fun or um, volleyball for fun, but it doesn't mean that you want to be the next volleyball player for your country. So it doesn't always mean... Um, like increased participation doesn't always mean that you're going to have a wider pool of talent to pick from because those people might want to compete at an elite level. So they're just some examples of um, assumptions that policy, sport policy is based off of. So um, just to recap before I put this piece of paper away is that elite sport, the virtuous, this is a virtuous cycle of sport and the reason why governments um, often fund sport is that it's based off the assumption that elite sport success leads to increased participation, which leads to a healthier nation and a wider pool of talent to pick from, which then um, will eventually lead to more elite success and national prestige. Um, so that's just an example of why a government would fund elite sport. So it's good to question those things. Why um, is your government choosing to fund a particular sport um, or why not? and what particular sport is it promoting um, and in what form. But the next thing that I'm gonna look at is how um, major sporting events affect policy. Um, or, so for an, ex for an example, Mandela used rugby to unite um, a group of people uh, in his nation. So it was done during a time of apartheid and it brought two communities uh, together. So sports can often um, lead to a change in, in policy or in politics and in particular major sporting events. So you can see that a lot of the time in um, the Olympics. So for example, the Olympics was used by um, Germany to change its image and repaint a different image of itself after Nazi Germany. Um, but my example that I'm going to talk about is ping pong diplomacy, which um relates to table tennis and how the well us and 
China, China relations. But what it looks at in particular is um, origins of sport and something called globalization. Uh, so why do why does certain sports that originate in one country spread to other countries and how can that go government or that country use that sport for um, diplomatic purposes. So if you don't know um, about what the relations between China and the US in the past, I know lots of people know about it today, um, what's going on today, but in the past, um, after World War II, China and the US cut ties. So that was around 1949. Um, the reason being that the US didn't want to associate with a common uh, a communist country. Um, the term ping pong diplomacy was coined because of events that happened in 1971. So a lot of what I'm talking about is in a book written by Nicholas um, Griffin. And he wrote about ping pong diplomacy and how ping pong was used to uh, change the world. So if you're interested in, in that, I would recommend reading that book. But there's also multiple YouTube videos that talk about it. Um, so if you want uh, uh, another bit of information in relation to this, you can also watch YouTube videos that talk about ping pong diplomacy. It's also featured in um, uh, Forrest Gump, the movie. Um, a section of it dips into the idea of ping pong diplomacy. So, as I said, ping pong diplomacy was coined because of events that happened in 1971. So we're going to look at what happened in 1971. So in 1971, um, the ping pong or table tennis world championships happened in Japan. And what happened at that time is that an American player, um, Cohen, missed his team bus to the games. And uh, a Chinese player invited him on to the Chinese bus. Um, and then they became friends. So this is was happening at an event where the world was watching and pe people were pretty um, aware of uh, tensions between the US and China and that uh, the world number one champion, which was a Chinese player, was inviting an American player onto um, the bus. And after um, their exchange changes um, and where they became friends, so like where they befriended themselves um, or each other, sorry, they befriended each other. Um, the Chinese player invited the American team over to China. And that was a big deal because for more than uh, 22 years, um, there was no communication between China and the US. So there was no Americans going to China um, and no Chinese going to America. So this was a political move. Um, and the number one Chinese player was pretty close um, with the president um, at the time. So um, it's pretty certain and in the book they mention it that uh, it was a political move and it was encouraged by the government um, to encourage this team to come over and participate in a friendly match between um, the American team and the Chinese team. Um, and it eased tensions between these two countries. But before I go into that, I want to talk about ping pong in China um, and how it was before all this happened. So ping pong is what it's called in China. Table tennis um, is what it's called in a lot of countries. But table tennis or ping pong was recreationally played in the US. So it was not very, um, it wasn't a very competitive sport, but it was um, the national sport in China at the time. Um, it was supposedly founded by the British Army, but what well, British Army in 1880, but um, the person that made it uh, what it is today, so modern table tennis, was a guy called um, Ivor uh, Montague. And Ivor Montague, so a bit about him, because it's important to how China um, then, or how ping pong became the national sport in China, is um, because of this man. Uh, Montague, so Ivory Montague. So here he was. He was a son, was a son of an English baron, so came from um, nobility. He was a videographer, but most importantly to the story is that he was a communist spy, and um, he gave order to ping pong or table tennis at the time and made it what it is today. So that was in the 1920s, and something that he did as well was that he encouraged. 
this sport and saw it as a working class um, sport. So encouraged it among the working class. Uh, and he theorized it as if it was a communist sport. So he was a communist spy um, and he made um, ping pong what it is today. But what he did was he traveled around the world promoting ping pong and encouraging countries to take it up as a sport. So they're often called globalization for anybody that doesn't know or wants to look that up. Um, but what he also did while he was traveling around the world promoting this sport was um, he used it as a cover for his spying. So as I said, he was a communist spy. Um, and at the time when um, President Mao's new government was put in place, uh, a lot of countries were not accepting this new government and saw Taiwan as the um, govern, governing body uh, over China. Um, so they didn't accept the People's Republic of China or well the new government. Um, but who did was Ivory Montague. He welcomed the president um, and invited him to enter a team in to the new um, sport that he had. So the uh, table tennis world championships that he was creating. And then it became um, a national sport in China. So at this point, ping pong became a national sport. And uh, in 1961, Mao uh, was invited to host the world championships. Um, and around this time, uh, what Mao had, was doing was in a rush to industrialize China. Um, and what happened as a result of that was that agriculture was abandoned and um, what happened what, as a result of abandoning agriculture was that it led to a famine in the countrysides in China. And um, this particular world championships uh, in 1961 was also used as a political tool because um, there was a famine going on in the country and they could use this as a disguise, um, as a distraction to what was going on to show that everything is go going okay in their country. Um, so that, that often happens in a number of countries where they use a global event, a global sports event or a, me um, a mega sporting event, which is often called in papers in sociology, um, to disguise what's going on in a country. So maybe um, economic disparity, um, or other social issues that are going on. Uh, so reshaping the image of their country. So they use this world championship um, in China to as a diversion from the famine that was going on. Um, so that brings me on to um, countries images or how sport can be used to represent a country in a certain way. Um, and sport on a national level is often used to repaint the image of a particular country to the rest of the world. So they can broadcast the, um, their country in a certain way through the medium of sport. And that was done, as I said, by um, Germany after Nazi Germany. So they wanted to reframe um, how Germany was looked at after um, the Nazi rule. Um, the case of China that I just mentioned, but also um, Brazil. So I'll be going into the next example, uh, which is the example of Rio 2016 um, Olympics. So how did Brazil frame its uh, image to the world using the Olympics? Something I want to um, highlight is what happened or how these mega sporting events affect politics. So that's the question that I asked earlier. Um, but also like in terms of politics, what I mean is how does it affect um, society and other political issues? Um, a lot of times when uh, countries are encouraged to host the Olympic Games or a major world um, sporting event, uh, certain countries, especially countries that are in poverty, have to build these giant um, structures or infrastructure to host events of this size. So not all countries um, have that capacity already. So they have to uh, invest a lot of government funding into cr creating these huge stadiums to hold as much people as they can during these events, um, which often leads to governments cutting back on funding that goes into local facilities. 
Um, so I would encourage you to look up um, funding or stadiums that were used during national um, or not national world championships and see if they're still being used today because often the case is that they are not. Um, but I'll be going into the case of uh, Rio 2016 Olympic Games. So how did that affect Rio um, and Brazil in general? So what I wanna show you now is a little picture that I've drawn to explain Rio. I know the words are backwards, but this is just a little diagram to show you um, a virtual map of Rio. So the airport, this is a little plane to signify where the airport is in Rio. Um, in the north, so there's two main zones in um, Rio, which is uh, capital. So it's the north zone. Um, and that's predominantly slums and low income families. So we have the airport, the north zone for slums and low income families. Um, and then we have the south zone where a lot of the um, tourist attractions are um, and the wealthy live there. So um, we've got a little um, tourist attraction and then high rise buildings to signify wealth in this particular area. But if you see, the airport is here so often, um, the road that leads to the tourist attractions um, goes past uh, some of the slums and low income residencies. Um, and uh, what was done in preparation for the Rio um, Olympics was a, w a wall was built uh, along a particular road that passed one of the poverty stricken areas in Brazil. So that area was called um, Mare, I think it was. Let me see if I have that written down anywhere. Yeah, um, it was called Mare. So the um, road passed uh, a slum in Mare, which is one of the poverty stricken areas. And what the government did was build a wall to um, hide away that poverty. Um, so tourists and visitors during the games uh, would not have to see it. So they built a wall along um, the slums to get to uh, the capital or the tourist areas. But there was also um, another area uh, that's of importance, which is this area over here. It's called Baja, um, but it's B-A or or A in or, um, or is in Portuguese are pronounced H. So this area is gonna be important. The Olympic Park was built um, in uh, Baja, so down close to the uh, tourist area, um, but slightly away from the poverty that was in the north. Um, so I'll go into that. But before I do, what I want to say is um, how these areas were affected. So in preparation for the Rio Olympics, what was done? What happened was that 11 bus routes between the poor region and the wealthy region were cut. So just before um, the Olympics, bus routes from this region to this region were cut in preparation for the Olympics, which made it harder for residents, poorer residents that lived here to go to the beaches. So there's really nice beaches down here um, for these residents to visit beaches or any tourist attractions. Um, which is uh, discriminatory. Um, and it was part of the reason was to discourage tourists from visiting these poverty stricken areas. Um, so they altered these bus routes to encourage visitors to visit certain areas and not others. Um, so hiding, hiding the poverty. So I'm gonna move on to this region. Um, which is Baja. So that is where the Olympic Park and the Olympic Games, most of their actions were going to be played, which is um, in the Olympic Park, so Baja. And what happened in this area was that a lot of real estate investment was put in to make this area bigger and um, nicer uh, during the Olympic Games, but also a place, it was considered a place for the elite um, to live uh, and a lot of money was pumped into this area. A particular um, investor or property developer was a guy who was num the 12th richest guy in Brazil. Um, and he 
was using the Olympic Games to um, propel his career and have a lot of um, property built here. Basically, he sold a lot of uh, buildings. And what something he said, if you're interested, I'll be linking the article, the Guardian article, which covered this, um, where this real estate investor used the Olympics to um, propel his career and build up this particular area for the elite. What he wanted to do was house um, the elite and not house the poor. He, he had a particular quote. I um, can't remember what it was. What was it? Yeah. Noble housing, not for the poor, um, is what he said. Um, but what what happened as well was that there was a lot of little settlements for working class people who couldn't afford the um, housing in other richer areas had built settlements around this area. Um, and in preparation for the games, they um, had received eviction notices um, to move away from this area into public housing, which was a bit further away, out of sight of the Olympic Games and visitors visiting um, Baja. And now there is only um, 20 families. So a lot of people accepted the money that the government was giving for them to move away from um, this particular area, but others were resisting and said that they didn't want to leave their homes um, and only 20 of them stayed. So there's a lot to consider there in terms of um, well, one main one is that visitors come and go, but locals will stay. So the country is building up huge high rise buildings um, or uh, huge stadiums that local communities um, won't be using. And they're not investing uh, this money into uh, local facilities for people in poverty stricken areas. So you're seeing huge buildings put up uh, pretty close or well not pretty close but um, further the money is going into richer areas rather than po poverty stricken areas is what I'm saying um, so the poor are made poorer and the rich are made richer basically um, so it was widening the economic disparity in Brazil but that's I'm not saying that to um, put down uh, any country but you see that in a lot of countries where um, big big um, world sporting events are used to funnel money into particular areas and away from minority um, communities or um, poverty stricken areas. <coughs> and the reason for that is because mega sporting events um, are viewed by people all over the world. So that's a particular country wants to encourage uh, uh, or wants to put, promote a certain image of themselves so they don't want to show the poverty that's occurring in their area they're trying to show their um, natural and uh, national prestige and their success and all the good things that they're doing look at these lovely um, tourist areas aren't they so beautiful um, don't look at the the slums and um, uh, poverty stricken areas just as an example um, so infrastructure is built around tourism and visitors come and go but the local people stay and they're at a disadvantage for because of the funding and being funneled into these <coughs> so um that's basically the main ideas that i wanted to put out to use in this session so thinking about why governments fund um particular sports what they fund so are they encouraging participation in a particular sport and who are they funding it for? Um, so in the case of Rio uh, 2012 Olympics, the uh, people that are affected by poverty were being even more, um, or the worst, their situation was being worsened. Um, so sport can affect people in various ways. And um, on politics, it's important to think of politics in this relation, um, in, in this way. So um, what we looked at is why governments fund elite sport, looking at ping pong diplomacy and the Olympics or the political agenda around the Olympics um, in Rio 2016. So before I go, what I want to say is thank you for watching um, today. And if you're interested in this sort of topic, I've covered previous um, ideas related to gender, um, racism, 
and ideologies in sport in general so ideas about sport um, in general so if you're interested in those check those out there on um, the global goals world cup facebook page but they're also on the global goals website um, so all the, the videos are archived um, but i would encourage you to um, look at the other videos that are being put up tomorrow tomorrow is global um, day for of solidarity so global day of solidarity is tomorrow if you're interested in checking that out um, or being a part of it write global goals um, uh, global day of solidarity into um, uh, google and you'll find all about all out about all of that um, so take part in that and thank you for watching my name is amina and you've just watched a sociology of sport session bye